Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Well, let's open up our time of worship and prayer today. Lord, we gather here in your name to worship you. We're here to draw near to you. And we pray that this morning that you draw near to us. Lord, just pray that you would touch each one of us and that we would just be wrapped in your love and in adoration of you. Lord, we dedicate this next hour to you. Lord, just pray that you help us to focus on you and to give you our all as we worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. Let's stand together and worship in song. Worlds his mighty voice obey, love which never shall be broken, for their guidance he hath made. Praise the Lord, for he is glorious, never shall. Strength and 
glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you filled with wonder service where we pray together we know that God hears us when we pray but it's even more powerful when we come together and we're all praying together agreeing with one another in prayer and in unison so we have a moment to think if there's something or somebody you'd like to pray for or if God puts put something on your heart and there's really not a right way to do it if you've not comfortable with praying publicly it's just opening yourself up and pouring your heart out to god uh, praising him and asking him to meet our needs as well as to help other people so let's let's pray this morning lord we thank you that we could come here we thank you that we have a praying church, Lord, that lifts one another up in prayer and comes before you. And Lord, even though you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who the Bible says, in you, Jesus, all things are held together, the eternal one, the beginning and the end, Lord, that you know our name, you know everything about us, you know our thoughts, and rather than slaying us for them and the things that we do, you love us and call us to be your children. Lord, today we marvel at that, give you thanks, give you worship and praise for you are worthy. And Lord, this morning we lift up the many requests or we thank you for the prayers that you have answered. And this morning, I particularly want to pray for a couple of our members that are not able to be here. Lord, just pray for Dolores for a quick healing. Pray that she'd be able to return home. And thank you that her broken leg is healing ahead of schedule. And Lord, pray for Pastor Charles as he's in a care facility. Lord, just pray that you give him excellent care help him to not be in pain 
I uh, pray that you strengthen him and just pray that you encourage him and give him peace. And now I'd like to lift, uh, open up the requests to the rest of you to pray. about them for all of our requests, both big things and small things. Lord, we just pray that you hear our prayers and would answer. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue our worship and song. Oh, 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 oh,
So this morning, the last Sunday of the month, we observe, better word, celebrate Holy Communion. With communion, it means the union that we have with God. Bible tells us that once our sins are forgiven by Jesus in his death and work on the cross, that God looks at us and interesting wording that he remembers our sins no more sees us as perfect and holy people 
And we Bible also tells us because of this we can boldly approach the throne of God with confidence. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It's hard to wrap our minds around being able as individuals to have this unity with him. So we proclaim our love of God, our unity with him, as well as the communion that we have with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ being God's children, as well as the unity that we have with other believers worldwide. And we invite you to share in this most holy un- this most holy meal with us if you have invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I'm going to ask the deacons to pass out the bread now. And as we do that, I will um, lead you in prayer. Scripture then teaches us to examine our own hearts before we take communion. It says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. So, what this is asking us to do is to take a moment and have an examination of your own conscience and life to say, are there, is there anything in my life, any areas of my life that aren't right with God? So let's take a moment to have silent prayer, to do business with Him, and ask forgiveness of sin in any area of our lives where we may need it. for loving us we thank you for making us for yourself thank you for giving your son Jesus Christ to us to offer forgiveness of sin Lord whether it be sins of commission meaning things that we've done to offend you or sins of omission things that we didn't do when we knew the right thing to do Lord pray that you forgive us of all our sins whether we realize we did something or not pray that you bring to mind if there's any areas of our lives that we displease you or withhold from you. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for the union that we have with you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. this represents the body of Christ which has been broken for you so that we might have forgiveness and have eternal life let's take and eat this together
Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you gave to us by dying on the cross. Thank you for forgiving us. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we'll pass the cup around and take it together. of all that the Lord has done for us and with gratitude let's take and drink together Lord we give you thanks and praise for all the wonderful things that you've done for us thank you for saving us thank you for giving us your presence in Jesus name Amen, amen. God, we just thank you so much that uh, we can worship you by the offering, Father God. I thank you that uh, we can give back a little bit of you gave us, Father God. And we pray that we use it in the mighty way to draw a lot to you, Father God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Children are dismissed. So for about the last two weeks, we've been hearing about revival that's been taking place in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury University. I keep seeing it pop up in news headlines. And this week I watched some YouTube videos seeing what was taking place there. And well, it's a wonderful thing an answer to prayer when God pours out his spirit upon a place and the nation takes notice. It seems that we've drifted further and further away from God as a nation. And it seems like the time is very ripe and this is very, very badly needed. Many believers have been praying for such a work of God. And now it's been spreading to several other universities. So many of us praise God for it. But with the articles, you see, not everybody's excited about it. There are some articles out there that are criticizing the, what we believe to be this move of God. And that makes sense. Not everybody's a Christian, so secular journalists are trying to understand what's been going on. Maybe even describing it as a mass hysteria going on as people are crying out to God. And what started as a one-hour chapel service turned into about two weeks of round-the-clock spontaneous worship and prayer as the chapel is filled and people traveling from far and wide once they heard about it to come experience this move of God. But secular critics are understandable that if you don't believe there's a God, then how could he pour himself out and touch people? So you have to find a way to explain what's going on here. And so that's definitely understandable, but what's hard to understand is Christians that criticize it. Other believers that say, like, well, you know, it's just a bunch of people getting all emotional, and that's not what a real move of God looks like. And it's easy to stand back and criticize, and you think, okay, where's their revival? Where, where is their move of God? What great things are they doing for the kingdom? Yeah, usually you don't see any of that. Which really reminds me of the passage that we read today. I'll tie it in in a minute, but let's read it first. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Levi got up, left everything, and follow him. followed him. Now this is just like the call we look, looked at with um, when Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John. He went to their place of work, which was a fishing boat, and called to them, follow me. But this is different. This is, Jesus calls a tax collector. Now, maybe there's... There's nothing wrong with collecting taxes or working for the county assessor's office as we have, but Roman tax collectors, there are a lot of nuances to this. We see in the Bible that lists of sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors. And if you don't understand the history of it, it's rather puzzling to say what's so bad about What's so bad about a tax collector and why do they deserve to be lumped in with these other great sinners? Well, the Romans had conquered and ruled over Israel. And basically everybody that lived in Israel that was Jewish didn't want the Romans there. They were an unwanted occupier. And the tax collectors were usually Jewish people that worked for the Romans collecting taxes, and they were well known for their corruption and dishonesty. They would collect the taxes that were owed, and then they would collect a little more or a lot more for themselves. And if you didn't pay up, they'd sick some Roman soldiers on you to force you to pay it. So 
they weren't very popular. But it's kind of like in, in some cultures, some countries rather. I mean, most, most police officers here are good people that are trying to protect us and do the right thing. And we have a few bad ones in the mix, but a lot of, a lot of other countries, it's well known that in some countries that the police are corrupt. Maybe they're on the payroll for drug cartels and you want to be avoid, you want to avoid them as much as possible. You certainly might not want to call them for help. When I was a teenager, I went to Mexico with my grandparents for a trip. And the first, I went with them several times, but my grandpa sat me down and explained to me then that things are different there than they are here in a lot of ways. And one thing are the, a lot of the police are corrupt. So if you see anything go down, you see a crime committed, um, you don't want to come forward as a witness because they'll throw you in jail and hold you there for months till it's your time to testify so that you don't go back to the U.S. So I don't want that to happen to you. So um, as many people do there, you need to look the other way. And, you know, I'd never heard anything like that. It was kind of shocking. But such, such was the case with uh, tax collectors. Um, a few of the other Gospels use the name Levi and Matthew interchangeably. This is Levi or Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus, verse 29, at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So Jesus calls this tax collector Levi, Matthew, to come follow him and to be his disciple, to be a disciple of the rabbi. Usually the disciples of the rabbi were training themselves to become a rabbi. So picking a tax collector to do that was provocative and shocking to say the least. But Levi holds a great banquet, and who comes a large crowd of other tax collectors and others who are eating with them. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complain to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So like I mentioned, the, this great work of God, this revival that's breaking out, having not everybody happy, happy about it, having critics that sit back and tell you what's wrong with it. This was the same thing happening here. The Pharisees, teachers of the law, the Pharisees were usually the ones that were in charge of the local synagogues in that time. Other, other rabbis mostly looked at Jesus ministering to these people and saying, geez, how could Jesus sit and eat with these people? Why would he call a tax collector, this sinner, to be his disciple. So they didn't approve of it. They kind of sat back and shook their heads. They were critics. Now, really, there's two kinds of people out there. There's people who do stuff in the world, get things done, and accomplish things. And then there's people who stand back and watch. And people who stand back and watch and criticize. I think of sporting events. You know, if you've ever been to a professional major league baseball game, it's it's more fun to watch it than on TV because you always get people that are there and they're excited about the game and they're yelling and you know, I there are some bad pitches thrown, people start yelling at the pitcher as if the pitcher can hear them. It's always funny, you see people that look very uh, non-athletic, to say the least, sitting there yelling at the pitcher like, you stink, you don't know nothing about baseball, you can't pitch. You know, and sometimes you can't help to think like, okay, why don't you get out there and uh, you get out there and show them how it's done. It's, 
it's the critic or i'm you know the, been to a few fun super bowl parties or been at other people's house you know that are really into a sport and they're yelling at the tv <laughs> telling the telling the player what to do yeah the the critics that know how it all should be done these guys, these Pharisees, were kind of like the politicians that have all the answers of how we're going to fix all the problems, but then in reality, they don't do a thing. We, we see that again and again, every election that comes up. All the things that they're going to do, all the things that should be done, all the things that they know how to fix. And then usually most of it doesn't get done and doesn't get fixed. President Teddy Roosevelt, one of the great presidents of our country, uh, gave a speech in Paris on citizenship. And this, is, this part of his speech is called The Man in the Arena. It's powerful words that I've read many times. He said, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of his high achievement, and who at his worst, if he failed, at least fails while daring greatly, so that this place shall never be with one of those cold and, and timid souls who neither knows victory nor defeat. Powerful and exciting speech there, saying, hey, it's not the people who count that stand back and criticize, what counts is the people that are in there doing. And so that came to mind in this passage with the Pharisees and teachers of the law complaining to Jesus' disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? God is not for them. Why are you trying to give God to them? Because God's not for them is what they're saying. Jesus answered them and said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. We'll read this answer again. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, how are we to understand this? Robert Schuller, the preacher that was on for years with the Hour of Power, I heard him say that a lot of people think of the church as a museum for saints. One that has people here who have it all together, who has everything all figured out. The godly people, the holy people. He said, no, that's not what church is supposed to be. Church is not supposed to be a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And he said, I want this church to be like the emergency room on a Saturday night, seeing all sorts of problems one after another. Boy, it's, it's messy, but people are getting help and people are being healed. Well, that's what Jesus is getting at. You know, hey, Jesus is saying, I'm not spending my time trying to teach the other rabbis here. Because they're, they're already trying to do things God's way. I haven't come to call the righteous or to preach to the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. And that was, seems like that was Jesus' main message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near here. He wasn't telling everybody that Everything they did was okay. He wasn't telling Matthew that it's okay to keep ripping everybody off, but to come and follow me and then rip everybody off in your spare time. No, it was go and sin no more. 
Repent there. I come to call sinners to repentance. But they were saying, why do you eat and drink with sinners and tax collector? Well, he explained that very well, but a few myths about what God wants. He had to set the Pharisees straight on this because they, they being religious leaders of the day, had no time for the tax collectors. No time for the no time for the sinners. They believed myth call it myth number one here, that God only wants certain kinds of people. God only wants certain kinds of people. Well, that's simply not true. The Bible tells us that God desires that all men should be saved. And Jesus spent a lot of his time, energy, and effort finding sinners, talking to sinners. People that everybody else ignored. People that, you know, you see them coming, you cross the street. Now, there's a thing in the culture that you need to be very careful who you sit down and eat with because that's fellowshipping with them. So none of these other Pharisees and teachers of the law were going to even sit at the same table with the tax collector or with somebody that they didn't see as godly that have done things the right way all their lives. They offered no hope for these people. These people, as they were treated, could never be saved. But Jesus says, hey, I've, I've come for them, and I've come to call them to repentance. Who needs to hear? It's like, who needs to hear a sermon more about the plan of salvation or God's love? People that already know it? People that have been in church a long time? Or the people who have never heard that before? Or... A lot of people out there think that God hates them. Been a lot of a lot of parades out there with Christians gathered on the sidelines yelling at people that God hates them when somehow they misunderstand that God loves those people just as much as he loves you. So people still seem to have that myth that they believe that God only wants certain kinds of people. No, God wants all people. God especially God especially wants the people who don't know him and who are living outside of his plan. Part of that myth of God only wanting certain kinds of people might be the myth that God only wants you to associate with certain kinds of people. Now, if we only associate with other Christians... How are other people going to be brought to Jesus? How are other people going to know God's love? Now, I think it's a fine line we walk. A lot of people, when they come to Jesus and make him their Lord and Savior and start following him, sometimes you need to get away from some of your friends and associates that are pulling you into things if you've been into certain things. You know, maybe... Maybe you're going to drift away from some friends. Maybe your friends that want to get together and use drugs, you need to distance yourself from them so you don't get pulled into it. Maybe you shouldn't be going to the bar every day after work anymore and getting getting pulled into that. But I think that's something between you and God that you have to know very well when you're going to be a bright light in people's lives and show them the love of God and be an example to, to people versus having them drag you down. So you have to know yourself and know what you're going to get sucked into. But otherwise, if there's things that you're not going to get sucked into or perhaps some time has gone by and you've moved on, then... No, you, sh- you should be eating at the table with these people. You should have some friends out there that are not believers to be the salt and light that God's called us to be. Now, a second myth with this seems like 
the Pharisees and teachers of the law in Jesus' time um, weren't having any fun. Myth number two is God wants to steal your fun, that godly people shouldn't enjoy life too much. No, the Christian life should be a great adventure. Jesus and the apostles certainly seem to have a good time, but these religious leaders here were, were saying, Jesus looks like you're having too much of a good time. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be having too much fun. People act like it too. A lot of us were raised with religious leaders that said all those things. They might have been well trying to protect us, but how many of us here were raised with people in the church saying no dancing? Yeah, no no dancing. I know some of the Christian schools around us, it's like no dancing. You can have a banquet, which is kind of like a dance without dancing. You know, like a junior or senior banquet, but certainly no dancing. Uh, no no card playing. Can't, uh, can't play go fish. Sorry, it might, might be a sin. You uh, can't play dominoes. You can't do... Uh, can't do a lot of things that seem fun because having fun might be a sin no I don't think so I think the intentions the intentions sometimes are right though like maybe maybe playing go fish is a gateway drug to poker and a life of gambling addiction I don't know but Let's get back to the text, verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Well, the the Old Testament tradition, just most fasts were voluntary. But the New Testament talked about people that like to do fasting to make a show of it, to show everybody else how righteous and holy they were. You know, like, oh, I haven't eaten in a day and a half. It's been 30 hours. I'm so hungry, but, well, I'm doing it for the Lord. You know, I'm doing it for the Lord. (laughs) Jesus was saying, no, you know, if you want to do that, if you're going to tell everybody that's your reward, but do it in secret so that he might have a heavenly reward. But the disciples, Jesus' disciples weren't doing it, but he's saying, hey, John's disciples are fasting, and so are the Pharisees, but look at you here, eating and drinking with tax collectors. Luke chapter 7 said, same group of guys, for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, And you say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. So, there they are, the critics, not the doers. Jesus was bringing a lot of people to God, showing them God's love. Well, these religious leaders just sat back and sat back and criticized it rather than doing some of that themselves. Now, one more thing with the tax collectors specifically, they had so many taxes on everything that historians don't even know all the different taxes that they have. And there's a lot of written records from the first century. One book, Christ and the Gospel, said there was a tax and duty upon all imports and exports, on all that was bought and sold, bridge money, road money, harbor taxes, town taxes. The classical reader knows the ingenuity which could invent a tax and find a name for every kind of exaction, such as taxes on axles, wheels, pack animals, pedestrians, roads, highways, admission to markets, on carriers, bridges, ships, quays, crossing rivers, 
on dams, licenses, insured on a variety of objects that even the research of modern scholars has not been able to identify all the names of all the taxes. So it says Matthew there was sitting in his tax office or sometimes translated a booth as he may have been a sort of toll taker of people having to pay to pass. And here's Jesus eating and drinking with them all, and rather than fasting, he told them, Jesus answered, Can you make the guest of the bridegroom fast while he was with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. Now, Jesus himself is called the bridegroom, and the church the bride of Christ. But he was saying, Hey, this is... This is not the time for fasting. This is the time for celebrating. When the bridegroom's here, it's like the wedding's here. We need to celebrate. And then he tells them a parable. No one, verse 36, he told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on to an old one. That's kind of ridiculous. I mean, we've we've gotten away from patching clothes as things are machine manufactured and clothes are a lot cheaper to us. For instance, per hour we have to work than it was for that time. But I think I think a lot of us were raised patching clothes, you know, sewing up a hole or putting a patch on or sewing up a hole in the sock. But this is kind of ridiculous right here that you don't buy a new garment and cut it and to make a patch for your old garment. It's kind of like, okay, my jeans got a rip in them, so I went to Macy's and bought a new pair of Levi's, and then I cut up the, dem the denim of the new ones to patch my old holy jeans. Jesus was just saying nobody, nobody does that. Nobody buys a new garment to cut it up and sew it on the old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. Maybe now, though, I notice a lot of people buy jeans with holes in them already. They must, they must not have done that in the, in the first century here. So yeah, you don't. So the old garment was rabbinic Judaism. The new garment is Christianity. If you highlight your Bible or look at it between verse 36 and verse 39, the word new appears a lot of times. New garment, new garment. The new will not match the old. And then wineskins. New wine, old wine. So we see this distinction between new and old. The new wine, the new garment is Christianity. The old wine and the old garment is rabbinic Judaism. If you just try to mix the two and have both, you have neither an old garment nor a new garment. If you mix the wine together, it's neither old wine nor new wine. Rabbinic Judaism with Jesus in it is neither Judaism nor Christianity. And then he says, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. We don't usually have wineskins. We have a bottle. So it might be hard to picture what happens. Uh, my first job, I was a lifeguard when I was 16. And we'd be standing out in the hot sun for sometimes all day long. Or during the weekdays, 
we'd spend about half our time lifeguarding and half our time giving swimming lessons. But on those hot days where we needed to stand out there, it was actually hotter than you would think because they told us that the pool deck, the white pool deck, would reflect heat and make it hotter. So if it was 102 degrees, it might be like adding 10 degrees with the pool deck there reflecting the heat to you. And it, the water as well as the white pool deck would magnify the effects of the sun. So they told us, you know, we're wear lots of sunscreen because you get burned easier and quicker here and drink lots of water because they didn't want lifeguards, you know, getting heat stroke and heat exhaustion. So, and wear a hat, you know, we're, we're a big, we're a brim hat. So, and having to like carry water around with you, I think I went to big five and I bought like a wine skin water boda because it was, it had a rope around it and, you know, it would just be at my side. And it was, it was more comfortable than having a bottle because it was the right shape and it was like a soft suede. And so I, I did that for four summers and I carried that around all the time with my water in it, which was easier than having to always be picking up and putting down a bottle as you rotate stations all day. But one day I'm just standing there and my, wine skin burst just out of nowhere just you know got me it's glad it was a warm day because it's just like a, it's there and just all of a sudden just got got me all wet so um anybody else here have a wine skin burst or am i the only one <laughs> And I imagine the wine would be a little quicker to be a little more corrosive because I, I didn't have wine on the lifeguard stand. Just, it was just water. It was just water, so it, it, it burst. I, I learned those things are only good for so long. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. So what was Jesus? Jesus was telling this parable to who? To the Pharisees and teachers of the law. So he's telling them, hey, you guys don't you guys don't want anything new. Myth number three, God wants us to cling to, to tradition so that we can have a monopoly on him. The Pharisees acted like they had a monopoly on God, like, hey, I'm better than everybody else because I have God and the rest of you all don't. A lot of Christians act like that still. Like we have Jesus, so we're better than any that we're better than the people who don't. No, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible teaches us we are all sinners saved by grace. Not of our own works, lest any man should boast. So hey, we're saved and we're saying, hey, we're lucky to be saved. We're lucky to know God. Not not because of anything we've done, not because we're smarter than anybody else, just because we're lucky because God saved us. And here, the old covenant, the covenant of Moses, the Mosaic covenant being the old covenant, and the covenant in Christ being the new covenant. One's the old garment, one's the new, gar the new garment. One's the old wine, the other's the new wine. So Jesus was confronting them, claiming to tradition. A lot of the tradition, not even in the scriptures, just man-made traditions, so they could act like they have a monopoly on God. Guess what? We don't have a monopoly on God. God's going to save whoever God wants to save. God's going to bring God's going to bring people to church that Maybe some people don't think that they belong here. There's a movie out right now. Some of you may have heard of it. I really want to go see it. 
I wanted to go see it today. I wanted to invite some of you, but it was, it was, it sold out, sold out today. It's called Jesus Revolution. And it's the story of the Jesus movement in the 1960s and Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie that founded the Calvary Chapel movement. Now, I've read part of Chuck Smith's book. Chuck Smith was the pastor and he met some hippies and he invited them to church. And a lot of them started coming to church and started hearing the word of God and getting saved. Well, the people at his old traditional church didn't like it. They didn't like the hippies coming in. And their big complaint is we can't keep letting these people in because not all of them are wearing shoes. Some of them people are coming in here barefoot. Can you believe they're coming to church barefoot? And they're going to ruin the carpet. So we need to keep them out. And he said, well, if that's going to be your attitude, I'm going to get out here. I'm going to pull up the carpet. So it's just going to be a bare floor so that these people could come in. They, they, they backed off after that because he knew they knew he meant business and he really was going to pull up the carpet. Well, that's, that's kind of what modern day being a Pharisee looks like. And he was confronting them of, hey, godly people, just because you're a rabbi, just because you're a Pharisee, you don't have a monopoly on God. You know what? The Pharisees get a bad rap. Being a pastor, when I see Pharisees in the Bible, I sit up straight and listen. Because guess what? Those are the religious leaders. And what am I? I'm a religious leader, so all of the things Jesus said to the Pharisees are things the religious leaders need to hear. It's, that's talking to us here, that we need to not make the same mistake that these Pharisees were making. That, hey, we don't have a monopoly on God, and we need to reevaluate the traditions that we have. People, people cling to them that there's only one right kind of music in church. And what is it? It's the music you grew up with, right? Every generation, the right kind of music in church is the music, the music you grew up with. People, a lot of people don't want the new because they like the old. That's what Jesus said to them. No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Jesus was confronting that, and sometimes we need to hear that. Myth number four, God wants to be used as a small patch to improve our life. You know, I think that we try our hardest. We do things the best we can, and then we mix a little bit of Jesus on top to, to get it done, to have, to have our help. Well, that's not the point. No, Jesus was saying, you know, we need to be, you need to be born again. You need to leave the old life. It's all new. It's not mostly old and a little bit of new. It's one or the other. We don't just need a little bit of Jesus. We need to be all in with him. He wants all of us. He wants our whole lives. We can't just sow a little bit of the new being Jesus. We can't just sow a little bit of Jesus on the part that we like and call it good. No, we need a whole new garment. We need to put a whole new garment on to have Bible talks about being born again, having newness in Christ, having a new life. The Bible talks about the new man in Christ and the old man, which is supposed to die when we find Christ. Now, a lot of people do this monopoly on God and do this patch of Jesus saying like, well, sure, it sounds good. It sounds good knowing God and having God to help me. And well, I'm going to be better than everybody else. And God's going to be on my side now. And God's going to do what I want him to do. I'm not going to listen to God, but instead of listening to God, I'm going to be his advisor. I'm going to tell God what he needs to do. And that's just it. We want to be the critic. We want to be the Pharisee. We want to be the man outside the arena that sits back and tells God what to do. Now, when, when you have a higher power that 
follows you around and you tell him what to do and he grants your wishes, that's called the genie. That's not a god. A god. A god is one that changes our lives from an in, from the inside out and makes makes all things new. Jesus here's confronting real righteousness versus self-righteousness. Those that are actually doing the Lord's work versus those who stand back and criticize the Lord's work. I think a lot of churches struggle with that. People that sit back and tell you like, you know what, let me tell you everything that's wrong with the church. Let me tell you all the things that you need to fix. Let me tell you all the things that we should be doing when, hey, sometimes the people that say that aren't doing it, aren't doing any of it, aren't willing to do any of it. They're outside the arena. But God wants us inside the arena doing his work. And much of his work, as Jesus was telling the Pharisees, who it seemed were hearing it for the first time and really needed to hear it, reaching out to sinners, calling the sinners to the repentance, offering them the love of God outside the church, eating and drinking with sinners, tax collectors, gluttons, prostitutes. They need the love of God more than we do in a lot of ways. Let's never forget that. And let's, let's continue to worship God as we close in song and have the announcements. And if any of this spoke to you today or you feel like you're needing some prayer in your life, just want to invite you to come forward and pray with me. If the Lord, if you feel the Lord's calling you forward and you'd like some prayer today as we sing the last closing song. Women's ministry are all, all ladies here. Today is the last day to sign up for Secret Pals. Forms are on the back table. Sign up and fill out a form and give it to Peggy if you want to do the Secret Pals, which the ladies have done, given, giving secret gifts to each other uh, and having the big reveal right before Christmas. I know a lot of people, a lot of the ladies had a lot of fun with that last year. Um, next week, sun, next Sunday, March 5th, we'll be celebrating Darwin's birthday right after church, and cupcakes will be available. His uh, birthday's on the 9th. And whether you're a visitor here all the time, I'd like to ask you to fill out a Connect card which is in the back of a chair in front the chair in front of you. There's pens in there as well to let us know how we can be praying for you or there's a link online as well. Also remember you can give online for offering via your bank bill pay or by mail if you wish. And 
thank you to everybody that signed up for helping with the children and teenagers time for Sunday morning, both the Sunday school hour from nine to 10, as well as children's church. And it's things have been changing here a bit. I know everybody wanted youth and kids, but now for the last couple of months, we've been having some of them show up every week now. Um, coming over from the, most of them from the fast kids after school program. So we do need more help or even if you're willing to fill in every now and again, if somebody's missing like, like this morning and also last week, sometimes the, the helpers are sick. If you're, if you're willing to be there some of the time, I mean, it's an opportunity to shape the next generation and to a lot of these, a lot of the kids that have come in on uh, after school program, haven't been to church before, don't know, don't know anything about the Bible. So it's a, it's a real privilege to do that. And an opportunity that we have, there's signups on the back table. Girls game night is this is Thursday, March 2nd at 6 PM for uh, playing dominoes. Also, we're rounding up a new members class. If you're interested in finding out about membership, we'll do it and we'll do it in one sitting. And I've had some interest expressed, but if any more of you are interested, please let me know and we could find a time that fits everybody. As usual, check the announcements for, check the bulletin for other announcements as well as the slides after, after worship. And with that, as we close, let me invite everybody to stand for the benediction, which is the blessing and will be dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>